All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And happy Mother's Day to you. Um, let's see. I hope that you were able to get a gift, ladies, when you came in. We just we give these gifts to all the ladies, and uh, you should have got some chocolates and a flower. If for some reason you didn't get the chocolates, you can get them when you leave, okay? I don't want you to be without that. Um, and if during the service you get a little tired, just go on out there and get some more chocolate, okay? <laughs> we're, we're, we're really glad that you're here. Um, this morning, uh, we want to look for ways to respond to the Lord and how He is working in our lives. One of the ways that you can respond today is, is to fill out a Connect card. So anytime during the service, uh, if you have a prayer request and it comes to your mind, fill out a Connect card. At the end of the service, you can drop it in one of the boxes in the back. Um, if it is your first time with us, please fill out a Connect card. You can put it in the boxes or in the offering plate uh, when it comes around. We're just, we're just really glad that you're here and expectant about what the Lord might do um, in our presence today. I want to start off by reading from Isaiah, Isaiah 57, and we're going to sing. This is what God's Word says. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. That's who God is, by the way, guys. Let me just read it again. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. This is what he says. I dwell in a high and holy place. And also, you see what it says? And also. And also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Let me pray before we sing. Actually, would y'all stand with me as we pray? Stand up with us. Heavenly Father, as we stand in your presence, we confess that you are the high and holy one you inhabit eternity, every moment that has ever been, and you dwell with those who are contrite and lowly in spirit. And we thank you for dwelling with us and coming near to us. We just pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would remind us of your presence here with us, that you would point us to truth today, to truth about you, so that we may not believe the lies of the world and the lies that our heart makes up, but that we might believe you because you are true, you are holy, you are awesome, and you love us. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing out together. We're going to bookend our singing with this song today, and let's sing out this great hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Sing it out together, church.
church only that he is holy well let's read out this scripture together this comes from our verses for today that we're going to be studying in Ephesians chapter 4 we're going to read verses 22 through 24 I would love for you to read it with us talking about our new identity in Christ let's read it together to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Amen. We're going to continue to sing out about the holiness of God that we get to experience because of the work of Christ. So let's sing this out together. Hallelujah. together worthy is the lamb worthy is the lamb who 
in your presence, O oh Lord, we confess you are holy. This means that there is no one like you, Lord. Lord, no one so wise. Lord, as we think about our lives, and um, this is a difficult day sometimes on a Mother's Day. It's always a difficult day. We think of things that we wish were different and what we would have done differently. And, but we confess, Lord, that you are wise and that you are sovereign. You are in control. And we confess that you are good. You're always good. And we just thank you for this opportunity to just remember your holiness. You're set apart. You're high and lifted up. And we just want to honor you and just praise you. This is what brings us joy. We don't come together for any other reason today than to, to stand before the Grand Canyon of your awesomeness today. And to be small. To be small, but to find great joy that you are very big. And so uh, lead, us, lead us into joy no matter how we're coming into this room and no matter how we're feeling, remind us of the truth that you are, that you are good, you are awesome, you are holy, you are wise, and you can be trusted. So thank you for the opportunity to continue worshiping through giving. Thank you for the way, God, you always take care of us as a church. May we be faithful and true to you. Uh, thank you for your provision. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Amen.
What a great song for Mother's Day. Um, well, if you would, uh, at this time, uh, take out your bulletin. You can take out your bulletin and your Bible. Um, let's start with your bulletin here for a second. I just want to mention a few things uh, before we open God's Word. Um, you see there's a VBS reminder in there. Um, invite some folks to VBS. I want to... <clears throat> I want to say thank you to uh, Susie and Everett for the uh, the plant fundraiser last week. Uh, I'm just curious, how many of you got a plant last week? Yeah, a lot of you did. That's good. Um, we raised sixteen hundred and seventy-four dollars from that. Yeah, amazing. And this money goes to send people to Puerto Rico this summer. We're going to Puerto Rico. And, uh, and so you have helped us. You have partnered with us uh, to send our team to Puerto Rico, and we really appreciate that a lot. Um, just a few, a few other things you can see. Uh, we are, uh, where is our Easter offering? Our Easter offering is at $10,200. All that money, just so you know, leaves our church, and that goes to fund uh, church planting. Uh, some 50% internationally, 30% through the state of Virginia, and then 20% to one church planner, actually that came out of our church. And so you have a picture for us there, Matthew? Yeah. He will eventually. Um, yeah, there we go. Let's send our church planners out. And um, so please, please give to the Easter offering. We'll give through the end of the month. So on Pentecost Sunday, the last Sunday of the month, that'll be the last Sunday that you can give towards that. And again, this is the Antons, and they're, they're planning a church in Charleston, South Carolina. And so um, it, some of you have asked me this, and um, we have, what you said, how can we like find out more information about the church? Or like we're interested in, in maybe joining the church, but we feel like we need a little bit more information um, that's what the next steps class is about, and that's coming up this Saturday at nine o'clock. It's from nine to about noon, and so just a one-day class. If you need childcare, you can write on a, a connect card. Hey, I want to come, but I need childcare. Just let us know. We'll provide childcare. We'll have some food there. Um, we want it to be easy for you to be there um, on that day. Kristen wanted me to remind you that that no graduates that you need to submit the name of the graduate by May 21st. We want to recognize them in the service at the end of the month, and, um, and, and we need the graduate to be present to be acknowledged. Okay, all right. Other things you can read for yourself. Uh, some exciting things coming up. Let's get into God's Word. If you have your Bible, I want you to go to Ephesians. Last week we were in Ephesians, and as I was, as I was studying God's Word, I was thinking, I just need to camp out on something that we talked about last week, and I think this would be something important for Mother's Day. And so, um, go to Ephesians chapter 4. That's where we're going to be together. Now, Mother's Day is, is a wonderful day. It, it reminds us, well, we all had a mother, amen? Can I get some agreement there? I mean, if you are here, you had a mother, and we praise God. Without our mother, we wouldn't we would not be here. And we want to we want to show her honor. Um, but today is a day that is hard for so many different reasons. And I just sat there and wrote a bunch of them down. I won't read them all to you. But as I was just thinking about different people in our church and just different situations, um, I, I mean, it's hard because a lot of us are grieving moms. Yeah, are you grieving mom today? Uh, mom has gone home to be with the Lord. You're grieving mom. It's hard, isn't it? It's a hard day. You're grieving children that have passed. I can't imagine a greater hurt for mom than to grieve a child that has passed. It's really incredible. I know my mom's probably thinking about that this, this morning. Grieving uh, wayward children, children that don't show up. Breaks my heart to hear moms talk about the kids that don't show up. I just want to go shake them to death, you know. <laughs> um, Maybe you're grieving, you know, not being a mom. And you say, I'd love to be a mom, but for whatever reason, I have not been able to be a mom right now. Maybe God said no, or God said wait, and that's really hard. So there's a lot of reasons today, and I'm not, I mean, many more I didn't mention that this, this can be a really hard day. 
And, and here's, here's something about grief when we're feeling these emotions. Um, is that sometimes when we're grieving, we're vulnerable to lies. Do you know that? When you're grieving, you're, you're vulnerable to lies. The lies can creep in and tell you. Tell you things that aren't true and you can believe those things and hold on to those things. Um, and what Ephesians chapter 4 says is that we have to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. How many of you know that the mind is a very important thing? To, to guard your mind. So much happens in the mind. The mind is like the, a rudder that controls the whole body, doesn't it? I mean, I mean think, think about it. You know, there's, in the Proverbs say, As a man or woman thinks, so is he or so is she. You have to take your thoughts captive. That's what Paul says. Take your thoughts captive to obey Christ. Your thoughts Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, it says, renew your mind. Renew your mind. And we, we used this illustration last week. We were talking about our minds. Um, they're, they're such a complex thing, but at the same time, in a way, they're simple because you can really only have one thought at a time that is permeating your mind. Uh, I bet if we went around this room, I could say, what are you thinking about right now? And if you were honest, I bet every one of you could say, this is what's on my mind. This is what's on my mind. And because our mind is like the slide projector. You remember the carousel slide projector uh, from elementary school? And, and, and the teacher had a little button and she pressed and it went cha-ching, cha-ching. And it could show one slide at a time. <laughs> we have moved light years beyond this now. But one slide at a time. Well, your brain is kind of like that. Your mind. And we can either get one image in our mind or one kind of narrative permeates our mind, uh, one truth or one lie that you can hold on to. And one of the things Paul tells us about lies is that lies that we believe, they're, they're deceitful. They're really deceitful and they're tricky. And sometimes, if I went around again and said, hey, what lie are you believing in your life right now? You would have no idea how to answer me in that, probably. Why? Because your lies, they hide. And you can't really tell what they are because you have thought about them and, and you have internalized them to a point that they actually seem like they're truths. Um, and, and so this morning, what I wanted to do was, um, I wanted to talk about just the truth. Sometimes it's hard for us to analyze what is the lie that I'm believing that I'm living out of currently and what is the truth of God? Well, you know, when they, those people uh, look for counterfeit bills, how do they find the counterfeits? Do they study all the, the really good counterfeits? No, they study the real thing. They study the actual currency and that's how they find the counterfeit. And that's what I want to do. I want to look at the truth of who God is because in the scripture we're going to read in a second it says the truth is is in Jesus. The truth is in Jesus. Jesus says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Right? That is the thing, to know the truth of who God is for you. Because we can sing holy, holy, holy today, can't we? But until you realize who God is for you in your current situation and that these attributes of God that we sing about actually matter for your life, you cannot experience what we have talked about. It's transforming grace. That all starts with the mind. Transforming our minds. I wanted to give you, before we read our scripture, just a little book recommendation. And, and uh, here's, here's a book recommendation. Uh, Lies That Women Believe by Nancy DeMoss. She got married a few, few years ago. And I think it's, Lindsay, how do you pronounce her new last name? Vogamuth? Okay. You can go to the next slide, buddy. Uh, the next slide. Yep. Yeah. And so th that's a great book, Lies That Women Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. They also have one, her husband wrote one, and uh, it's Lies That Men Believe. And it's actually a pretty interesting perspective. I won't go into it today, but the men's book, I put it was on Christian audio because I know you guys don't like to read. I'm just kidding. There's like three of you here that do. But, um, but listen, you can listen to the audio book. It's really good. Some of you do Audible, get the audio book, listen to it. And for, for ladies, I think this is a great podcast 
uh, for you to listen to. If you have a podcast app on your phone, you can get one, download it from the App Store. Uh, Revive Our Hearts. Revive Our Hearts. Uh, Nancy does uh, this podcast, Revive Our Hearts, and I've listened to it with Lindsay before, and it's really solid stuff to give you some encouragement in your walk with Christ, ladies. You know, what you put into your mind really matters, okay? Because whatever you put into your mind is going to transform your mind. Revive our hearts. I don't see many of you writing, writing that down, but okay, yeah, you should. You should revive our hearts. All right, let's read our, let's read our scripture today one more time. Ephesians 4. We're in verse 20. Paul says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. He says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Can you say the truth is in Jesus? It is. To put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful, lying desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And put on the new self, which is created after the likeness of God. Did you know the new self in Christ is created after the likeness of God? Isn't that awesome? That's what he's trying to transform us into. It says, in true righteousness and holiness. Let's pray. Father, give us understanding of your word. And would you remind us that we are who you say we are? not who we feel like we are. Would you remind us of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is given to us as a gift, as a gift. And if we are in Christ, we are a new creation, and you look at us and you see the righteousness of your Son. And we thank you for that. We ask you to open your word to us, teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. I gave you these four truths last week, and I just wanted to talk about them a little more this week. And um, because the thing that we need, I think, most in life is to remember the truth of who God is for us. That is so important. Jesus is sovereign, okay? Jesus is sovereign. I don't have to worry, okay? He is. What, what, you say, Dan, what do you mean by sovereign? Sovereign means possessing supreme or ultimate power. Jesus is sovereign. He possesses supreme and ultimate power. Power. Sovereignty is, you know, the attribute of a king. A king is sovereign. There's like nobody that can go, no, you can't do that. Like, mm mm, nope, mm mm mm, you cannot. Nobody can tell Jesus that. He's like, he says, I do, I do what I want. I do what pleases me. You know, you think about even Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own account. I have authority to lay it down, I have authority to take it up again. No one's going to take my life. I don't give my life, but you're not going to take it. Why? Because he's the sovereign king, and he's the resurrected king who is at the right hand of God, who, matter of fact, if we could crack the door in the throne room, you would hear him praying for you right now. There he is. He's right there. He's praying for you. He's sovereign. He's the king. And in the, the early church realized that if we could really get this truth about God, it would change everything about our life. If we could just get it deep down in our souls. That's why you got to sing about it, because songs get down in your heart, you know? The early church, Acts uh, 4, verse 27. Um, Peter and John were just arrested. They've got some tremendous hardships in their life, and they, they say this, they pray this after they get released. For truly in this city were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, they're praying to God, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to thwart the plans of God and to crucify the Son of God. No. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Sovereign. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak the word with boldness. What is it that comforted the hearts of these people? What is it that gave them this boldness to go on and to keep proclaiming the good news? It was Jesus' sovereign. 
He's sovereign over heaven and earth. All authority has been given to him. Oftentimes we don't feel that way, do we? Oftentimes we feel like, you know, my situation is sovereign. And, and like there's some fate, you know. We believe in fate and just the roll of the dice and chance and, you know, what will happen will happen and whatever. Did you know that God works all things according to the counsel of his will? Like, like all things. That means even like the bad stuff that, that happens to our life. God determines before it happens that I will allow only the things that will grow them. I will only, only allow the things that will develop them. I, these other things, I will not allow those things. He's sovereign. He's sovereign. And we were talking about this on Wednesday. Um, you know, what is, the, what is the worst thing that's ever happened in the world? Let me tell you. That God became man and they killed him. That's the worst thing that's ever happened in the world. God became man. The creator condescended and became like us, the creation. And they killed him. And they spit on him and mocked him. That is the worst thing that's ever happened in the world. And don't you think Satan was like, yes, it's exactly where I wanted him. Exactly where I wanted him. I've been trying to destroy him, and this is my chance, and I will take it. But do you know that in the very act that Satan, he, he thought he had victory, right? He came into the heart of Judas Iscariot, and he's like, I got the victory. What happened? Jesus rose from the dead. He turned that whole thing upside down. In, in the moment that we thought death had killed the Messiah, the Messiah said, I just destroyed death. In, in the moment where we said, all sinful people win. Jesus said, I just conquered sin. And I just opened the door wide. The veil is torn. Come on into the presence of God. You know, he turned that thing around. And here's a phrase that I read. He said, the cross is now the standard by which Jesus is running the world. What, is, what, what, what was meant by that phrase? The cross is now the standard. Because that is happening not only for Christ. Christ is in heaven. He is reigning over all these things that are happening. And it's happening in your life. The way that we have to go is, Jesus said it, take up your cross and follow me. It's the way of the cross. It's a way that looks like death. How many of you feel like you're looking at death square in the face? But what does Jesus do? I turn the tables on death. I have the keys to death and to Hades. I have the keys. You know, it says, it says in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. People have a love-hate relationship with that verse, don't they? Because we look at our life and we say all things are not good. Some things are a mess, and I can't make heads or tails of half the junk that has happened in my life. Well, let me read the phrase to you again. The cross is now the standard by which God is running the world because even in that mess Jesus can turn it upside down you may never even see it in your, your lifetime but here's the truth Jesus is sovereign and you can trust him you can trust him he is sovereign what are you worried about today what are you worried about today what's on your mind today what's on your heart You know, worry is always about the future. Anxiety is always about the future. It's very future-oriented. What's going to happen, right? I was talking to a friend today, and he was, he was just he was really struggling with, what does my future look like? And I could just hear him. He was just longing for better days. He's just longing for better days. Longing for an escape from his current reality. He was worried. <laughs> he was worried, is this ever going to change? And, and the reality is this, God is not going to tell us all about the future. That's not going to happen. 
None of us can have certainty about what's to come in the future, but we can have clarity about one thing, and that is who holds the future in his hand, right? I love this poem. I'm going to read it to you. My father's way may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache, but in my soul I'm glad I know he maketh no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray. My hopes may fade away. But still I'll trust my Lord to lead, for he doth know the way. Though night be dark, and it may seem that day will never break, I'll pin my faith, my all to him, he maketh no mistake. There's so much now I cannot see, my eyesight's far too dim. But come what may, I'll simply trust and leave it all to him. Listen to this last part. For by and by the mist will lift and plain it all he'll make. Through all the way, though dark to me, he make not one mistake. Friends, he is sovereign. He is sovereign. He doesn't make mistakes. The truth is, Jesus is sovereign, so I don't have to worry. Let's keep going. Jesus is glorious. I don't have to fear others. Jesus is sovereign. I don't have to worry. Jesus is glorious. I don't have to fear other people. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. The fear of man is a trap. It's a trap. If you, if you fear man, if you're looking to other people for your affirmation, that's a trap. You fall into that, you fall into a pit. When we need other people's approval, when we're, when we're, when we're worried about what other people are going to think. We used to call this back in the day peer pressure. Anybody ever heard that term, peer pressure? I grew up in school and I, I had um, the D.A.R.E. program. Does anybody remember the D.A.R.E. program? Yeah, I see that hand. I see that hand. Yeah, the D.A.R.E. program, and, and, and what was it? Was it uh, the dog? What's his name? Was it Gruff, the crime dog or something like that? Is it McGruff? Okay, I'm sorry. McGruff, the crime dog. And what was his famous phrase that he would always tell people? Take a bite out of crime, and they always say, say no to drugs. Say no to drugs. I mean, I almost had this feeling as a kid that there were just people like lurking around every corner, like with like some drugs, you know, and it's like, <laughs> hey, I just wanted to offer you these drugs. Would you like some drugs? That's never happened to me. I, I mean, I'm just curious, show of hands, how many people that's happened to that's some like, lurking around the corner trying to offer you drugs, and they're calling it that, drugs, it's drugs. Um, that's never happened to me, you know, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think that's why I say no to drugs, and uh, I never see that anymore. But I have never felt pressure to do something because somebody offered it to me. I have put pressure on myself. You know what I'm saying? I have put pressure on myself because I was concerned about what you might think about me. See, that's where peer pressure really comes into it, doesn't it? I put that pressure on myself. And... Um, you know, social media just is terrible. It just makes this problem. It's like there's already this problem of the fear of man. It's this fire burning inside of you. You feel like you have to please other people. Social media is like gasoline. It's like, let's just, let's just throw a little bit of gas on that fire. How about that? Let's see what happens there. Is it not? You know? Social media is like old school peer pressure on steroids. Is it not? You know, you know, how many people are going like to my, like my picture that I just posted about my family? You know, how many people are going to like that TikTok video I made? I think it's pretty amusing. We'll see who likes it. You know, what, oh, that person posted this comment. Now I'm going to have to see them tomorrow. I don't even think I can go to work. You know, it's this constant begging for affirmation from fallen, sinful human beings. Yuck! And, and we wonder why kids are so 
confused and purposeless because you're looking for worth in a sinful person. That person is not able to give you worth. God gives you worth and value and significance and purpose in life. Don't be looking to them. And, and moms deal with this too, don't they? We'll just call it airbrushed motherhood. Airbrushed motherhood. You get, on, you get on whatever social media platform you use and you scroll down and lo and behold, it's that girl from high school again. And you added her as a friend. And, but all she posts is these pictures about her little perfect children. And uh, she's homeschooling them. She's also homesteading. She's growing a garden. She has free-range chickens, and I think there's a cow, right? She takes pictures of her home. Everything is perfect all the time. Nothing is ever out of place. She takes selfies of herself, and she is trim. I mean, she is in shape. She's always looking good. Airbrushed motherhood. There it is, (laughs) and you feel it. You know, you got moms, they don't, we only post pictures of our kids when they're doing the right thing. You don't think about all those crazy moments where you're pulling out your hair. People taking pictures of exotic vacations. I haven't been on a vacation in years, right? That's what you're thinking. The only thing taller than your pile of bills is your pile of laundry, right? And you just feel inferior, inadequate. You know why you feel inferior and inadequate? Because you're trying to get your worth from a fallen person that wants to airbrush their life. That wants to give you the best picture of their life. Don't do it. Refuse to do it. Maybe you just don't need to look at that mess so much. Don't scroll through it. God loves you and he has given you his grace for your situation, for your life. And who gives a rip about theirs? You know, moms feel like they have to make everybody happy. There's a little phrase that I've heard is, uh, you're only as happy as your least happy child. You ever heard that before? You ever heard that? You're only as happy as your least happy child. (laughs) Should that be the case? It shouldn't be, but it feels like that many times because don't we kind of tether our our happiness and our joy and our well-being to other people oftentimes? You know, and you feel like, well, my daughter's invited me, my adult daughter has invited me over to this event, and I don't really have time to do it, but I'm going to do it because I don't want to lose her, right? Or my, or my young kids are, are, are kind of screaming and crying and going nuts, and why can't I get it together? Why can I not fix this situation? Are you maybe connecting your worth and your identity to these little ones in a way that you shouldn't, that you can't? God gives you worth and value. The fear of man or little babies is a snare. Those who trust in the Lord will be kept safe. Trust in Him. Uh, Trust in Him. Here's the thing. If Jesus is glorious, nobody else is. (laughs) If Jesus is glorious, you can be free from people's uh, smiles and frowns. If Jesus is glorious, you don't have to be controlled by your least happy child. If Jesus is glorious, you can be free from likes and comments and compliments. Um, I was thinking about, uh, there's this place, I think it's in, well, it's in a couple Gospels. In Matthew, where uh, James, Peter, and John, Jesus allows them to come with him on this mountain. And he says, come with me, I'm going to go up on this mountain. Just come with me. And and on the mountain... uh, the, the word of God says he is transfigured before them. In other words, he, he allows the glory of who he really is to be seen. I don't know if he's shining or what is happening here, but there is some kind of Shekinah glory happening in this moment. And all of a sudden, guess who shows up? We got Moses, he's showing up, and we got Elijah, and these guys are losing their minds. And Peter, it says in this text, he doesn't know what to say. Now, you tell me, when you don't know what to say, don't, you know how this goes. But he did say something, and he said, oh, it is good that we are here. 
I will make a, a tabernacle for Moses and one for Elijah and one for Jesus. And you can all have your own tabernacle. And what happens in this moment after he says this? It says immediately Moses and Elijah disappear and there's only Jesus. A voice comes from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. You know, the law, Moses, the prophets, Elijah, they all point to Jesus. But what I'm thinking of as I'm thinking of this story is really just the glory of Jesus in this moment and how God is letting Peter know, stop looking at other things. He is glorious. Everything else isn't. Focus on him. Don't fear man. Look to him. Number three, Jesus is good. Jesus is good. Jesus is sovereign. I don't have to worry. Jesus is glorious. I don't have to fear others. Jesus is good. I don't have to look elsewhere. We talked about this last week just a little bit. You're familiar with the story in John 4 about the woman at the well. Um, it's a woman uh, that has had a rough past. She has had five husbands. Five husbands. And Jesus says, the man you're living with now is not your husband. And they're at a well, which is just so picturesque, isn't it? Because this woman has been going down into this well of relationship trying to get water, right? Maybe another man will quench my thirst and really love me and not leave me. Maybe another one. And so she's trying to quench the thirst that is in her heart. And Jesus comes to her and he says, Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Then he says this, But whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. <laughs> the water that I give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And isn't that true for all of us? <laughs> we can think about the thirsts that we have what have you been thirsting for? I could tell you right now. I can tell you the things, you know, look at your browser history. Look at, you know, where you've been writing checks to or how you've been swiping your credit card. We have, we have been thirsty. I'm thirsty. And the thirst that you have in your heart is from God. It's not bad. It's not bad to be thirsty. It's not bad to want joy and significance and fulfillment. That's not bad. Jesus just saying... Come to me for that. Come, come to me, and you won't thirst again. And you won't thirst again. The, the, the truth here is Jesus is good. I don't have to look elsewhere. I don't have to look elsewhere. He is good. He satisfies. He is the satisfier. And keep going. These are truths. These are truths. What, what, which one of these truths do you need to apply to your life today. Jesus is sovereign. I don't have to worry. Jesus is glorious, so I don't have to fear others. Jesus is good, so I don't have to look elsewhere. Jesus is Savior, so I don't have to prove myself. I don't have to prove myself. We don't work for God's love, do we? Um, can you work for God's love? Is there anything that you could do with the rest of your day today that could make God love you a little bit more? Just, I mean, something? Does God love you more because you're here today? Yeah, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can fail to do to make God love you less. Maybe God may be displeased with us. God sometimes gives a spanking. I've received a few spankings from God. But there's nothing I can fail to do to make him love me less. I am loved fully in Christ. And I, we were looking at this on Wednesday from Hebrews. Uh, in Hebrews, I, I count at least three different places in Hebrews where it says that Jesus was the once and for all sacrifice for our sins. And then he was risen from the dead, and then he sat down. He sat down. Yesterday was a busy day. I can remember when I sat down. Anybody have a busy day yesterday? 
and you just you finally sit down and you're like, whoo, and you breathe, you breathe that sigh of relief. And what it, what's in that sigh? What is that sigh communicating? <sighs> it's finished. It's done. The day is completed. Jesus sat down so that we would know the work is done. <laughs> Man, that's good news. The work to please God is done. What can you add to your salvation? What did you contribute to your salvation? Nothing but your sin. You didn't contribute. It's not Jesus plus, is it? Jesus plus my best efforts. No, no, it's not. And Jesus plus being a good mom, right? It's not that. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. You try to add to Jesus, you lose Jesus. Jesus plus something equals nothing. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. The work is done. It is finished. He sat down. Hebrews 10, verse 11. And every priest stands daily in his service in the temple, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away Sins. Let me just stop here for a second. Did you know in the Old Testament temple there were no seats? Y'all check me on that. I don't think there's any seats where the priests ministered. Look around you right now. Are there any seats? We got a lot of seats, okay? But in the temple, there were no seats. Why were there no seats where the priests ministered? Because their work was never done. It was never finished. Year after year, we're offering sacrifices. We're offering another sacrifice, another sacrifice. There's always work to be done because people are always sinning. This is what the Word says. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Let me just tell you, um, ladies, speaking to ladies and men, this applies, all of this applies just across the board. Do you feel like you're offering again and again the sacrifices? Again and again. I'm sacrificing myself over and over again. Let me just tell you, Jesus is not offering any more sacrifices. He made one sacrifice, and he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Are you seated today? <laughs> yeah, you all are. Rest in his sacrifice today. You don't work for God's love. We work from God's love. We work as a response to God's love. Matter of fact, all of our life is worship, but we ain't trying to work for nothing because you can't work for a gift. You receive it, you sit down. I think it's possible to be in some of the worst possible circumstances and to have the joy of Christ. We all have hard times, that's for sure. We, it's never all roses, is it? Life is hard. We're living with under the curse here um, for a little while longer. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, right? So, But right now, we're living in a, a sin-sick, cursed world. But it is possible to be in a yucky situation and a hard situation and a painful situation and to have a renewed mind. Have you known anybody like that yourself? To be in a, in a really difficult situation, to have a renewed mind and to have a different perspective on everything. Everybody else is like, look at this. Look, look at you right here. What's going on? But it's possible for you not to focus on all, th all those things as if those things are telling the whole story, you see, but to rather focus on who God is for you in that moment. 
As I was thinking about that point, I was thinking about a, a lady. Lindsay and I went to see, I don't remember how long ago it was, um, several years ago, Joni Erickson Tata. And she came into my mind. Here's, here is Joni. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about her story. I remember when we saw her speak, and she also sang. and um, it, it was just um, really quite an experience to encounter this woman. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about her story. Joni trusted in Jesus as a teenage girl at summer camp. She said in her story that uh, in high school, um, she kind of got confused. She, she thought following Jesus was the same as the American dream. <laughs> she didn't realize they were different things. And so she said, I found my prayer life was praying, God, give me a boyfriend. <laughs> or God, help me to lose weight. Or, God, let me pass this test, or let me get into this school. She confused things, you see. It happens. And she knew by the time that she was ending high school that something in her relationship with God wasn't right. Something needed to be turned back the right way. But she didn't know what it was. A few weeks after graduation, she was with her sister at, uh, at the beach. And I suppose they were in the sound playing and there was a a little floating dock and they had swam out to it to to play and jump off of it and and Joni jumped off of that dock and did a dive and when she did she dove into just a few inches of water not knowing it and um and her head was pulled back in her fourth uh vertebrae I believe it was crushed, and her spinal cord was severed at that point. Um, she had use of her all of her neck muscles, her shoulder, her biceps are pretty strong. Everything else, she cannot move. She instantly became a quadriplegic. She tells that story, and she tells about laying there with her face down in the water, not able to turn over. And she said, in that moment, I just wanted air more than anything. I never wanted air in my, so much in my life. And she said, my sister didn't even see me make the dive. And he said, it was a crab that bit her. And she turned around to let me know, there are crabs in the water, be careful. And she saw me and saved my life. And so, um, this lady is now in her 70s, by the way. Um, and so she's lived her life as a quadriplegic. Um, you can look her up on YouTube, and she, she takes several people just to get her ready in the morning and to, to do all her makeup. And she said, if I don't ever look the same way, you know that maybe somebody else did my mascara, you know. And, uh, but she said, I really struggled after I had this accident believing that God loved me. She said, I really, all these lies started to kind of flood into my soul. My circumstances seemed to be telling these lies of God doesn't care about you. God is done with you. You've screwed up and you can never change. This is just God's judgment on your life. So many lies just started to filter into her life. And she said, somebody came and, and, and spoke this scripture to me from Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, right? Plans to prosper you and not harm you. And she was like, what? God, you have harmed me. You haven't prospered me. And she said, I would go on to actually read the context of those verses and see that they were written to God's people when God was sending them out into exile, into a bad, nasty time. And, and she realized that sometimes actually God does hurt our bodies, where he allows hurt to happen to our bodies. But one thing that he does is he holds on to our souls. You know, he holds on to our souls. And um, I, was, I was reading this article about her husband. She, she married years later, and his name is Ken, and I, I think they've been married over 30 years. But um, they were asked a question about having children, and they really thought they were going to be able to have children. But after many attempts, they were not able to have children. And they said it was very devastating because they wanted children. 
uh, very badly. And um, as he said, one day they were talking about it and praying, and they just resolved that this is what God is telling us. God is saying no. And they said, well, then we'll adopt the children of the world. <laughs> and so, uh, so Joni and her husband, Kenan, they've gone to, I think, two-thirds of the, the countries in the world, taking wheelchairs to handicapped kids and um, reminding people that have disabilities that God loves them. Uh, this is one of the camps they did a couple years ago in 2001. Um, God's ch chosen ambassadors. <laughs> and helping, helping people with disabilities see that their disabilities don't define them, that that's God's job, that he defines them. Um, and, and I remember when we saw her, it was just a, it was just a beautiful thing. And, and just to look at her, she looks just wonderful and just so pain-free. But she says, I have chronic pain all the time. And my life is hard. And she says, but what all of this pain and difficulty has made me do is has focused me on the grace of God that's in my life. And I, I just, I hold on to every bit of grace that he brings my way and I give him thanks for it. Sometimes I get really anxious and I get really afraid. And she says, but that's what keeps me. That's what holds me is his grace is what's holding me. Um, and as I was, as we heard her story, I just can't help but to believe this is a woman that has decided not to let her circumstances and the lies that come from grief be the thing that speaks into her life. She said, I'm going to let God speak into my life, and I'm going to believe what he says is true that I am loved, that he has a purpose for me. I, I mean, she, she even made a comment to say, if God would have allowed things to be different in my life, even to the point of me having children, I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have done all the things that God would want me to do. I'm accepting that this is what God has for me and receiving it as his gift for me, even in the hard times. I want to ask our prayer team if they would come um, and Pastor David. Um, I would like to, uh, for us to stay seated. Um, and I'd actually like to read some scripture to us today. And I'm going to have David play this song and maybe I want you to think about your life and maybe lay some burdens down today, down at Jesus' feet. Jesus' words to you today are, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's listen to this song again, and let's take some time to respond. If any of you would like to pray, our prayer team is here. They'll be here even after the service for you. But let's listen to this song and spend some time with the Lord.
a prayer prayer time for moms. And um, I know for a lot of us, our mom is not here with us. And maybe our mom has gone on before us or just isn't able to be here right now. But uh, you can think about a mom that's in your life. Maybe she's a friend. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's somebody in your life group or somebody you're close to. And what I want to encourage you to do is, uh, if if you're here with a mom, to put your hand on her. I'm going to come down and put my hand on Lindsay. I just want to have a time of prayer. And what I want you to do is just uh, pray. Pray for them. I want you to pray according to the scripture. Come to me, Jesus says, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Would you just pray that these moms would take the yoke of Christ upon them and not the yoke of the world, not the yoke of what they feel like they should be doing, but to take the yoke of Christ. I'm going to ask Christian to come.